Master give the blessing. Wisdom. What you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators, and all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus, and we're picking up uh, once again with step number 26, and as we've said, it's one of the longest of the steps of the ladder on discernment, and uh, again, it is the fruit of humility, and that once one has set aside the impediments uh, of the passions and abandoned oneself to the will of God, then a kind of clarity begins to emerge. The healing of the noose, the eye of the soul, the eye of the heart, and one begins to be able to contemplate uh, the things of God, the things of the kingdom, but also our own sin. And in order that we uh, might up, uproot it, but also to avoid temptations as they come to us. And so a lot of this uh, section has to do with the attacks of the demons and the subtleties of these attacks and how we might be able to recognize them. And so immensely helpful step all around. And uh, we are picking up with 127 halfway down the page on page 207. St. John writes, amongst the impure evil deeds, there are some more evil than others. They suggest to us that we should not commit sit alone, but they counsel us to have others as companions in evil in order to make our punishment more severe. I've seen one learning a bad habit from another. And although he who taught came to his senses and began to repent and gave up doing wrong, his repentance was ineffectual on account of the influence of his pupil. And so, despite the fact that he came to his own senses, realizes the depth of his own sin and repent, he's still responsible for leading another into sin. Better a millstone be tied around one's neck and one be thrown into the sea than to lead one of these little ones into sin. And, uh, and so, it is a grave thing to encourage others to turn away from God and to follow us into sinful behavior and while we can repent for ourselves uh, we also bear the burden of the sins of another who we have caused uh, to commit those sins and so it's no trifling thing and uh, we are to be as much concerned about the spiritual well-being of others uh, as we are about our own and that we would guard and protect what is precious within them as much as we are attentive to what is precious within our own hearts and the gifts that God has given to us. And so this is a stark warning uh, about this uh, in John's text. Number 128, stupendous, truly stupendous and incomprehensible is the wickedness of the evil spirits. It is not seen by many. And I think that even those few who see it see it only in part. Thus, how is it that while living in luxury and plenty, we keep vigil and do not sleep, 
And why, while fasting and exhausting ourselves with labors, are we pitifully overpowered by drowsiness? Or why does our heart become hard while abiding in stillness? And why, while sitting among our companions, do we come to compunction? When we are hungry, why are we tempted by dreams? Yet when sated, we do not experience the, these temptations. In poverty, we become dark and incapable of compunction. But if we drink wine, we are happy and easily come to compunction. He can, he can do so in the Lord. Let him bring light to light. I'm sorry, let him bring light to the unenlightened in this matter. For we are not enlightened about this. At least we can say that such a change does not always come from the demons. And this sometimes happens to me. I know not how, by reason of the constitution I have been given and the sordid and greedy corpulence with which I am girt about. So it's an interesting paragraph because John is saying that sometimes, uh, despite uh, what our focus is and despite our discipline, we might act in a contrary way to what uh, we would expect. And so when we are being very disciplined, we might give ourselves over uh, to, uh, to thoughts that are temptations for us, even when we're fasting. Or, but when we're drinking wine and with our friends, we are easily moved to compunction. And so John says, you know, I really don't know how to understand this other than the fact that perhaps it is uh, tied not always to the demons, but to our natural constitution or lack thereof. And so part of our discernment is being capable of seeing the movement of temptations as they come upon us or the approach of the demons, but also to be aware of ourselves, our uh, natural defects or our natural strengths that might open us up to virtue or its opposite. And so discernment is not only then uh, being able to see the movements of the demons as they approach us and seek to draw us as, uh, astray, but we can do it to ourselves uh, if we are not watchful simply by uh, our, our, again, by our particular constitution. Uh, some, for example, might find it easier to fast or to get up early uh, than others, and uh, yet, despite that, uh, fall into various forms of laziness or negligence. And it's not necessarily because of the temptation of the demons. David writes, is this related to as one gets closer to God? Sometimes the attacks of the demons become stronger and often in different ways. Um, I thought that at first, too, in reading it, and I think that's certainly true, uh, that the, the demons um, are relentless and the attacks often become more fierce as one grows in particular virtues and, uh, and unrelenting. Uh, but I think what John is saying here is that uh, things in the spiritual life are not always going to be reasonable or play themselves out in a fashion that we would expect, that we have to be prepared for uh, uh, kind of surprises like this or for the unusual thing to emerge, that a person might break into tears of compunction when least expected. Uh, and again, that might be to their temp due to their temperament uh, more than, uh, than to having given themselves over uh, to uh, reflecting upon their sinfulness. And it might, again, even appear during, during uh, times of joyfulness when uh, they're not necessarily contemplating their sins, but drinking wine with their buddies. And uh, so the vigilance that must be ours must take into consideration uh, our natural state, our personality, our constitution, our character, our natural defects. And you can see why discernment is so tied so closely to humility in this, the ability to look at ourselves in the full light of truth and to be able to see the things about ourselves that perhaps we would rather not 
see. And, you know, John acknowledges one sort of at the end of this that, you know, I've been given a sordid and greedy corpulence with which I'm girt about. Um, I find that sort of hard to believe about John Climacus, you know, that, <laughs> that he had a gut or, or something along those lines. Uh, but uh, you never know, you know, the physical constitution of somebody might make them, you know, have a certain build and, uh, and, and so, you know, be perhaps more naturally inclined uh, to certain things. Number 129. With regard to the changes enumerated above, which are so hard to interpret, let us sincerely and humbly pray to the Lord. And if after prayer and the time which it took, we still feel the same thing at work in us, then let us conclude that it is caused not by demons, but by nature. Yet it often pleases divine providence to benefit us through adversity and to check our conceit by all possible means. So, you know, this ability to see what is the work of nature uh, is something that can be equally humbling to us. And God will use that uh, and use it as a kind of a adversity, affliction. Sometimes, you know, our, our body uh, betrays us in one form or another. And if God can use this to humble us and to drive away conceit, you know, that uh, we experience our poverty in one form or, an, or another, and we are brought low. Uh, sometimes that can humble us in, in a manner that is much needed. And, uh, you know, there are many stories of individuals, for example, who have uh, been brought low by illness, for example, and not able to do, you know, the work that they would want to do or seem fit to do. And so be humbled by this. And uh, it can be a difficult thing, but nonetheless, God uh, often will make use of it. And, you know, I think this is important for us to see in order that we might not become discouraged. You know, when, when it is clearly not the action of the demons, that it just has to do with our natural weaknesses and our poverty as human beings. Number 130. Oh, Sister Barbara writes, this translation says greedy and grubby flesh, not corpulence. <laughs> it doesn't sound any better. <laughs> I, and uh, uh, which he could have been grubby, you know, certainly lived, he lived in a cave a couple miles from the monastery for a good while and for actually decades. And so I imagine he was less than cleanly. Uh, number 130. It is dangerous to be inquisitive about the depth of divine judgments because the inquisitive sail in the ship of conceit. Yet because of the weakness of many, something should be said. So, you know, we often will be in inquisitive or call into question the providence of God, the wisdom of God in certain things as they play out in our life and how circumstances will develop, uh, where we are taken upon a path that is wholly unexpected and that does not seem to promise much in, you know, in terms of personal growth or the use of our abilities or whatever it might be. And so we can begin to call into question, why would God be doing this in my life or bring to naught something that I've worked so hard on for perhaps many years. And John says, we have to be wary of this uh, because it can be driven by conceit, you know, a kind of conceit of knowledge where we, where we place our own judgment of ourselves and our lives and what is good above God the moment that we begin to question it. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, today, uh, I had a little post from um, Jaron Tissa. Hold on for one second. I'll find it quickly, hopefully. Uh, 
where it says the spiritually advanced person, Gerontissa Gabriella, the spiritually advanced person is one who arrives at a place of no identity and who has understood in his depths that whatever happens is either the will of God or by the permission of God. And the person who's commenting, commenting on it, Melissa, was saying, you know, what do people think about the word no identity there? And one could see that in a negative way, you know, like the loss of a sense of self. And, uh, but I think what uh, she means and what the fathers often mean when they talk about this is that one can get to the point where so, one so loves God and trusts him and abandons oneself to his providence that one's own intentions uh, begin to slip away in the sense of not clinging to them, that one is seeking only to hold on to what God sets before them. And so whether what comes down the line in terms of our experience seems to be a blessing or a hardship, one, bless, one receives that as coming to God as a gift or uh, as a form of permission that he allows something to take place in our life in order to sanctify us. And this requires a kind of a, a willingness to let go of this conceit of knowledge that we uh, can grow in the spiritual life and think that we have a certain understanding of realities uh, about the you know, spiritual battle and yet still over and over again call into question the providence of God and the wisdom of God. When we come up against something that really is contrary to our sensibilities and sensitivities, and we begin to wonder, you know, what, what in the world is God doing? Or it seems impossible to us. Uh, Genesius writes, how can such inquisitiveness lead us to pride? Surely trying to understand divine providence can only... Uh, reveal our own wretchedness? Uh, is it that merely trying to understand is itself beyond us and thus an act of hubris and self-assertion? Yeah, you know, we, we see this even within the scripture that there can be a radical difference. Uh, the Annunciation where Mary asks almost the same question that Zechariah would ask, you know, how, how can this be? for I have not been with a man. And yet such a question can arise out of faith, a desire to comprehend, not a calling into question. Uh, whereas, you know, Zechariah asked the same question, but with a kind of doubt, you know, that he and his wife are very old and he, it's interesting what happens he struck silent throughout the whole period of the pregnancy. And I don't think it was punitive. I think it was to deepen this capacity to listen. You remember how we've talked again and again about uh, obedience being abadere, to listen. And so an obedience is placed upon him to remain in silence for nine months and to listen and contemplate on what God is doing. Uh, and we we see the fruit of that when it comes to the naming of John the, the Baptist, that when his tongue is loosed, you know, that he embraces uh, the name that is given. You know, when, he's, when others think that he should be given the name of his father, uh, he's able to uh, embrace what has been revealed. No, his name shall be John. And so the silence uh, forms and shapes the heart, but drives out that kind of conceit that would call into question the providence of God. You know, how, how could something like this happen in our old age? Okay, number one, I'm sorry, I've lost my place here. Number 131. Someone asked one of those who could see, why does God who foresees their falls adorn some with gifts and wonder working powers? And he replied, in order to make other spiritual men more careful and to demonstrate the freedom of the human will and to cause those who fall 
to be without any excuse at the last judgment. So in order that other spiritual men might be careful that often these stand as cautionary tells that we can uh, take for granted the gifts that are given to us by God and that we are never to cling to them as ends and themselves, uh, but rather cling to the faith that these produce within our minds and our hearts, that God has bestowed on us a particular gift for our sanctification or for that of others, but not to imagine that it, it arises simply as uh, a fruit of our own asceticism or our own goodness. And, uh, and so when we see someone who's fallen, even after given many gifts, sometimes it is because they take a kind of pride in it and, uh, and uh, you know, want to hold on to the gift uh, as their focus rather than allowing it to lead them to God. Uh, secondly, to demonstrate the freedom of the human will, that um, there's a kind of synergy that the fathers talk about between ourselves and the grace of God, that God does not force himself upon us, and uh, that God is not a despot, that the love is always something that is to be re freely received. And so the capacity uh, to be neglectful and uh, to, to be lazy, to not take hold of that gift uh, makes uh, us aware of just how fragile our, our human will can be and that we have to be exercising that will in such a way that it leads us to God or setting aside that will uh, or our willfulness in order that we might embrace the will of God in our lives. And then finally, to cause those who fall to be without any excuse at the last judgment, that um, we are not going to be able to free ourselves from the charge of the gospel uh, when we all see the, the multitude of benefits that God gives us, in fact, at every single moment, uh, that we are often uh, unaware of the depth of the love, the mercy that is shown to us, and even the life and the love that sustains us from moment to moment. And, um, and so these things and more are given to us in order that we might not make an excuse when we come before the judgment seat of God, uh, that we would say, well, I had nothing, or you provided me with nothing. And uh, I was weak, you know, when in reality, that God provides us with all that is needed to engage in that spiritual battle and overcome the enemy. Genesius writes, then when gifts are given, should we seek to hide them, lest we become prideful in them? I see this in many saints, but how does this not violate the divine command not to hide our light? Um, yeah, you're right. I think consistently within the writings of the saints uh, that we would strive to live, in fact, they say, the hidden life that our desire is to magnify the Lord and that the attitude of mind and heart should be that of John the Baptist. He must increase, I must decrease. And so if our, if the light that God gives us is manifest to the world, it is to glorify him. We see a radical difference between the humility of Mary that can boldly say, my soul doth magnify the Lord and the pride of uh, another who might receive a gift and say that not uh, as a joyful reflection of what God has done within them, but rather, again, uh, attribute it to themselves and to draw attention to themselves. And so the safer path uh, is uh, to keep those things hidden. If God wants them manifest, he will make them manifest. And uh, nothing is lost in that regard. Uh, 
you know, I, I think what we are not to hide is the gift and the light of faith of, you know, what we've become and what we've been given. Uh, not so much particular or extraordinary gifts where there is certainly a greater danger uh, in that. And we could see that even in our tendency to focus on the extraordinary rather than that which is enduring, rather than faith, hope, and love. You know, we, we would focus on, you know, miracles or speaking in tongues or whatever it might might be. And even Paul had to rebuke, in a, in a sense, those who he had brought into the faith for focusing too much upon the externals. Number 132, oh, I'm sorry, I think I missed one here. We're not bury our talents, right? And I think it would be the same thing here that, you know, certainly there can be those who are driven more by fear and bearing the talents reveals that there is no love for God and no willingness to, uh, to give oneself and all that one possesses to God. Uh, and so he's given one talent, but all that he does is bury it within the ground. And so sees God only as a fearsome judge. So what becomes evident in that gospel passage is that he has no love for his master. And so chooses instead to take what he thought was a safe route, but what it revealed is that uh, he did not hold precious the, the, the little that was entrusted to him and revealed that he was not worthy to be entrusted with more. Uh, and so uh, there's a difference between that, again, and not wanting to shine a light upon one's own talents to draw the attention of others. Number 132, the law being imperfect says, take heed to thyself. But the Lord being entirely perfect enjoined upon us the correction of our brother saying, if thy brother shall trespass against thee and so on, if your reprimand or rather your reminder is pure and humble, you should not refuse to carry out the Lord's behest, and especially with those who accept correction. But if you have not yet got so far as this, then at least practice the precept laid down by the law. So, you know, we, we are to go further than the law, that the perfection of our love, again, leads us to desire the salvation, the well-being, the sanctification of others, and that we would give as much care uh, to them and their spiritual struggles as our own. Uh, and But to do that with humility and purity of heart, and if it is uh, embraced in a receptive fashion, uh, otherwise we do fall back upon the law, take heed of thyself, keep the focus upon yourself and not turn the eye to another. And, and in fact, it is really only out of purity and humility that one is able to turn the eye to the other. I think lacking purity of heart, we're always going um, to see the flaws of others to avoid seeing our own. And, uh, and so, again, certainly great caution is needed here. Number 133. Do not be surprised when you see that those whom you love turn against you on account of your rebukes. Frivolous people are the tools of the demons and are used especially against the demon's foes. And so God, I'm sorry, demons can use those who are dear to us, those whom we love, to draw us into a kind of discouragement. And, uh, and so to have them turn against us because of our faith uh, then can lead us into a kind of despondency and sadness. And uh, John says, you know, there's, they're a frivolous 
uh, kind of frivolous nature there that does not uh, take life seriously and their own or others. And so it will become mocking towards the faith of others, but give no care to their own. And uh, this is you know, where we have to be careful in a number of different ways in this spiritual life. Uh, the joyfulness of the Christian, the uh, cheerfulness. You know, Philip Neri was known as the joyful saint and could even, you know, perform little practical jokes on on his disciples to humble them and things such as that. But one has to ask, where does that joy come from? And it comes from abiding in Christ. It's the joy of, of the kingdom, where so often our joy or our cheerfulness is, is rooted in the things of this world. And there often is a criticism of those who uh, pursue the path of, of faith and what we have to avoid is two two different extremes in the spiritual life taking ourselves too seriously and then uh but then not uh taking anything se serious at all and so john i think is talking about the latter here that uh there are those who are frivolous by nature who don't take anything serious about their life and uh, and so seem to have a kind of freedom seem to have a kind of joyfulness but in reality uh, aren't able to see the the beauty the dignity of their own life their identity in christ and the demons knowing that such individuals are often very dear to us can use this to undermine our pursuit of the faith by disrupting the natural relationships that we have with others and you know we hear this in in the gospel you know that one's own family members can reject you because of that faith and one in fact should expect that uh, that would happen again because you know faith is a gift and it is to be something that's embraced freely. Number 134. One thing about us astonishes me very much. Why do we so quickly and easily incline to the passions when we have Almighty God, angels and saints to help us towards the virtues and only the wicked demon against us? I do not wish to speak about this in more detail. In fact, I cannot. And so, you know, John realizes that, you know, it's hard to understand the mind of, of man, that we are so changeable and we can have this destructive element uh, in our life where we undermine uh, even that which is good and we take a path that leads to destruction. And so John puts it very simply, why is it that when we are given so much, when we are, when God gives us himself and the angels and the saints, and, and yet we will give in to a single demon, what is it? Uh, about that, other than, you know, our attachment uh, to our sin, but also the things that lead to that sin, and that we elevate that above the love of God. And one wonders if this is why John can't bring himself to talk about it, that we can hold the grace of God cheap, that we can uh, be confronted with the reality of the cross or the incarnation, or the gift of the Eucharist, and yet uh, turn so easily to that which is frivolous and offers no hope and life or true joy. And it is a mystery, and, uh, and a sad mystery, I think, that John sees in it, and so does not want to even linger within it uh, uh, for the thought that it would simply drive one 
into a kind of despair to acknowledge that one can be so easily drawn to the darkness. And, uh, you know, psychologically, uh, analysts sort of picked up on this, that there is this kind of drive for life that we have that is very powerful, but there can be this destructive uh, tendency or what Freud called the death drive. And it was sort of poo-pooed by other analysts and psychologists. It was, you know, his probably his latest theory and what he had sort of gained from the clinical work that there is something that in us that wants to move back to a place of stasis, of like non-being, or this, you know, the, the state of oneness with the other uh, before one has to, to deal with reality. And so one can do these things that are destructive, that undermine one's life altogether and in a way that uh, is unreasonable, that makes no sense, that is a kind of mystery that I think is tied more to our fallen state, the fragmentation that sin brings to our life, that internally we can be presented with the greatest gift of love and yet choose to reject it, to turn away from it and to embrace that which promises again, nothing to us. And so John would have us be aware of it. But I think he's worried that if we reflect upon that too much, uh, the, the darkness of it can lead us into a kind of hopelessness. Especially when we see a multitude uh, being drawn to that or ourselves being drawn to it often, where we find ourselves battling against it. And what they're talking about is not a kind of darkness of depression here. You know, it is something rooted more in, in the fabric of one's psyche and one's psychological makeup as well as spiritual makeup and, uh, and the influences that, you know, have had their impact upon us. And so I think for him, overanalyzing it really doesn't offer anything. Any thoughts ab about that? It's a rather curious little paragraph, but in my mind, it, it shows me again the depths, uh, the depth of the Desert Fathers. You know their capacity to understand these aspects of human nature and psychology that rivals anything you know that I've read in modern psychology. Here, it's all the way back in these early centuries that they, they saw the very thing that Freud clinically was seeing and that was rejected by most everyone that followed after him. You know, he caught a glimpse of it and he had no faith, you know, and so he couldn't make a tie uh, to sin in it, but he saw it active and how powerful it was in people's lives. Okay, number 135. If all created things maintain their nature as it was created, then as Saint, as great, I'm sorry, as the great Gregory says, how is it that I am the image of God and yet compounded with clay? But if some created thing has become other than that, then it was fashioned, it is certain that it will yearn insatiably for that which is kindred to it. The man ought to use every means to raise his clay, so to speak, and seat it on the throne of God. And let no one make excuses for not undertaking this ascent, because the way and the door are open. So you, you see what John is, is saying here, that despite being made of clay, that the, through what God has done, uh, in Christ, the embrace of our humanity, the taking of that clay upon himself, and the re redeeming of it uh, through his absolute obedience upon the cross, and through the resurrection, our, that very clay has been raised up to participate in the life of the Most Holy Trinity, 
So what we are brought to, the door that is open, the path and the way that is made open to us is something far greater than what Adam and Eve experienced, that we are raised up to the very throne of God itself. And uh, we have now within us, because of it too, John tells us, an insatiable yearning. And we've talked about this as we're desiring beings. We have this sense of lack, sense of incompleteness within us that is tied to the fact that we are made in the image and likeness of God, but more than that, that we've been redeemed in Christ. And so we have this insatiable longing that can be, only be satisfied by God. And we have to allow this to, to raise us up, that yearning within us to raise us up from seeing ourselves as mere clay to seeing ourselves as those who have been raised up to sit and do sit in Christ, who's the first fruits upon the throne of God. And again, you know, I think this is where we do a really terrible job in catechesis. You know, I think on some level we should communicate the, the glory and the beauty of our identity and dignity in Christ. You know, we focus upon, and even the fathers do this, focus upon the things to overcome, that have to over, be overcome, that we might be able to see these things with a kind of clarity. But, you know, sometimes we sacrifice something important there. Uh, if we neglect this more important aspect uh, that drives us, if we are only presenting the passions and the demonic attacks and the things that pull us down, and we lose sight of our dignity and destiny in Christ, we let go of this uh, godly or uh, kind of divine yearning, long, you know, this hunger for God and that God can only satisfy that draws us along. We are desiring beings. And if we lose sight of this, what is it that's going to pull us forward in the spiritual battle? So if we saw this, if we understood this one paragraph from John saying, our clay has been made something different. You know, we not, not only are we made in the image and likeness of God and that he breathes his life into us, but in and through the incarnation, in and through the Paschal mystery, we've been raised now to share in the life of the most holy trinity. This is our, our destiny and dignity. It's even, it's greater than we can begin to imagine. And if we could hold that before our eyes, then there would never be a time where we would lose sight that we have God, the angels and the saints with us and simply follow after a demon who's tempting us. We would see the preciousness of the life and the love that is, is ours. And so if our catechesis was complete, you know, I think there would be a deeper understanding of this that would make a person want to engage in the ascetic life and love it in the sense of what it, of the path that it opens up for us, which is the removal of the impediments to be being able to share in, in the fullness of the grace of God. Uh, Kate writes, Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, a French Carmelite saint, a one, wonderful, beautiful writer uh, and beautiful Carmelite as a whole, wrote, let yourself be loved by God. I often ponder this quote, why do I run from this love? Uh, we do not uh, allow, or I do not allow myself to be loved by God. Or why do I not allow myself to be loved by God? I think that's the question that John is asking. What, why don't we? What, what is it that holds us back? That what is that resistance within us that has to be overcome to be able to receive what God desires to give us? And I think part of it is ego that, that comes into being through this fragmentation of the self by when sin enters into the world. The self outside of and abstracted from communion with God. That's the only, it's sin. That's the reason for it. And that's what we see on the cross. 
uh, and the only th and we see the path that overcomes it, which is this love that's revealed to us, that is an eternal and everlasting love, even in the face of the fact that we are enemies or were enemies with God. So challenging paragraphs, but you know, well worth spending time going back and reflecting upon them. But, you know, I can't say it often enough, you know, the ascetic writers, you know, I think we should say ascetical mystical, because I think ascetic has certain connotations with it in our day that seems negative on when I'm talking about the spiritual life, as if it's kind of self-hatred, self-punishment. But uh, what is, uh, these two are tied together. You know, the ascetic life is tied to this vision of God, what has been revealed to us in Christ of our dignity and destiny. And so we embrace this life and we run the race because we see what is held out before us. Number 136. It excites the mind and soul to emulation to hear the spiritual feats of the fathers and their zealous admirers are led to imitate them through listening to their teaching. And so, you know, we read the fathers and we read the lives of the saints, not just out of curiosity, but to emulate, to imitate them and to imitate their practices, that they might spur us on uh, to victory. And uh, again, you know, we hold up a lot of heroes in our culture and all, the, all these different levels that, you know, that we encourage people to imitate. You know, the, again, the great athletes or the great academics and, and but the idea of holding up the saints and the martyrs, uh, we rarely do that. Uh, certainly not with the rigor that we do in the other areas of our life, We're, whereas we should be talking about them the most. Number 137. Oh, one comment came in. Ren Witter. I don't think, though that we run from the love of God when it feels like love. I can't even imagine doing that, honestly. I think we run from what we are taught uh, is the mysterious love of God, because more often than not, it feels like something terrifying or threatening or even wounding. We are told to trust that these things are manifestations of the love of God. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, you're right. It's not just because we don't see it. Uh, uh, I think it is because what we are presented with many times is not uh, a reflection of God. And our experience of those who have been given the responsibility of bearing witness uh, to Christ and the kingdom for us often can be manipulative. And uh, that uh, rather than leading us to, to Christ, uh, they lead us to them, themselves. And uh, I think this is why in our day, we should be wary of, and including the individuals who are placed in this position of the, like the superstar priest or bishop or, or nun, you know, the, the particularly gifted ones that becomes like superstars, social media stars, because um, there can be a danger certainly for them in, in that, uh, but the focus can become on the individual and the demons as we see in John's writings can be using the very things that are strengths, abilities, uh, talents, those things that are attractions, attractive, not to lead to Christ, uh, but to a distorted image that then is used for the destruction of others. Uh, and so the very things that seem to be Christ-like can create uh, an infatuation with the individual 
And this is part of the reason why John and the others say to keep certain things hidden and certain gifts hidden because one does not want the focus to be upon the self, but upon God. But if it is, it, it, the focus is on the self, then this unholy kind of infatuation begins to develop. And in some of the past groups, we've talked about this, the root of that word being infatuous, false light, uh, and uh, sorry to be repetitive again, but it was a kind of phenomenon in the desert that those who are out at night and lost would see a light in the distance. And they would think that it was the camp of others. And so they would move in the direction of that light, hoping to find their way, hoping to find uh, warmth, uh, comfort and direction, but it actually is an optical illusion created by the desert. And so a person can be headed off and often is headed off in the completely wrong direction and uh, end up dying in the desert because they are following that false light. And, uh, and this can emerge with uh, within the spiritual life, the, the, the devil can make himself an angel of light. And, uh, and he can use individuals who are to be representatives of Christ to do exactly that, to mimic, uh, to, uh, you know, be, be, well, mimic, I think, is the appropriate word, uh, to mimic that which is good. Uh, but beneath the surface, there's no reality or substance to it, and there's and Christ is not beneath it. Daniel writes, Christ says, everyone when he is fully taught will be like his teacher, imitating Christ and the saints indeed teaches us little by little until we are, are not like our fallen selves, but like Christ. Right. I mean, that's the idea that is being put forward here by John, to emulate, to imitate. We learn through mimesis, through imitation, through uh, imitating the others. And we do that from the earliest moments of our life. Uh, David writes, when I used to teach catechism, I heard many comments when discussing the saints saying, they are not like that, or it is not reachable from teens and even my sons. It seems helpful to discuss the whole lives of the saints, like the difficulties and the sinful past, of St. Ignatius. Most writings seem to focus on them being perfect and so special rather than the journey. Yeah, that can be an issue as well, you know, and the church has tried to address this over time in regards to hagiography uh, to really focus on what is more historical uh, about the, the lives of particular saints rather than things that often would emerge centuries after the individual lived to be very careful about that, not to put forward a kind of false image, but something that is far more complete. Augustine is another good example. You know, one who struggled terribly and, you know, there, but through the prayers of his mom, you know, would have remained in his sin. Uh, uh, and the life, you know, he had a child out of wedlock, all these different kinds of things. and. Uh, people often don't know about that, that the early part of that journey was not an easy one. But getting back to Ren's point, you know, I think it's an important thing, and I think it's something that is afflicting the church at the moment. There have been so many that have been wounded by the church and wounded by those who are representatives of the church that uh, it's devastating. Uh, in the sense that, you, you know, when you cripple a person's faith or trust in God because of your actions, uh, th this is why John says, you know, the repentance of an individual, even if they come to their own mind, is going to be ineffectual if they've led another into sin. And uh, similarly here, I think if, you know, one's actions and uh, you know, one's self-focus and manipulation of others uh, destroys that capacity to trust in God and his love, then that person is going to face a harsh judgment.
because of it. And this is, you know, discernment is important, you know, and uh, especially when uh, seeking out someone for spiritual direction, you know, that it's not, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing or that there is a person who's, you know, struggled experientially with all these things and is living the life. And that can be seen in such a way. Uh, and uh, because there is a hunger, a deep hunger that people have for counsel and guidance. And we've often said in these groups before that a starving man has no sense of taste. And so those who are starving spiritually will, you know, will gobble up what is set before them. And that is not necessarily going to be nourishing and actually can be just the opposite. So we, we, we need to be guarded and careful there. You know, we have, we have the saints, we have Christ himself, you know, we have the writings of the saints. We, we don't need to throw ourselves into relationships that are going to be destructive. Rachel writes, yes, this is true. We are all starving for Christ, right? And it's, and from what John says here, you know, it's, it's this extraordinary yearning. And because it's an extraordinary yearning, we have to be, uh, uh, you know, careful about where it's directed. Okay. Number 138. No, I'm sorry. Number 137. Discernment is a light in darkness. It return the return of wanderers to the way, the illumination of those whose sight is dim. Discerning the discerning man finds health and destroys sickness. So discernment is real, it's genuine when light begins to emerge as well as healing and uh, clarity and uh, you know, sickness, the sickness of one's sin begins to fade, that we know that that gift is something genuine and true, uh, you know, that which is harmful. And, uh, and there's a lot out there today, you know, that I think, again, that is misleading or is not substantive, uh, that can do more harm than good. I'm always respectful, I think, of the priests who don't do spiritual direction because they say, I have no experience in it, or that, you know, I have no time because I've, you know, I'm administering five parishes. And so it's not part of what is done on a regular basis. And there's at least a kind of honesty there. And, uh, but to thrust one's, oneself forward can be a dangerous thing. Number 138, all who show surprise at every trifle do so for two reasons, either from crass ignorance or else they magnify and exalt the deeds of their neighbor with a view to humility. And so surprise at every trifle, you know, clutching the pearls at every thing that one sees going on within the world or being filled with an angst over everything that we see going on within the church or what the Holy Father said this week or what the Cardinal said this week. There is a kind of distraction that is found in that. If that becomes the focal point of your faith life, if you are agitated in mind and heart, then there are two re reasons for this. If, you know, if you're surprised by things, shocked, disturbed by these things that are going on, then it's crass ignorance, he says, that one does not understand the spiritual life and the battle with evil that is, is taking place and how it takes place and where we should be attentive to that battle within and that, uh, or else to magnify and exalt the deeds of their neighbor with a view to, hum to humility, uh, you know, in this, but a kind of false uh, humility, 
uh, in the in the sense of making the, this enormous deal out of something uh, in order still to draw attention to themselves. Or perhaps it is making something out of nothing about uh, a spiritual good or something that we see in another that would be better left uh, not commented on. You know, somebody says one wise thing and then all of a sudden, you know, they're you know, this great and wise guide. So a lot here tonight and this probably is a good place to cut off anybody have any final comments questions concerns about what we we looked at this evening it's a lot nope oh there is yes sister barbara one's image of god is so important a distorted one gets in the way of li living faith truly this needs to be examined and renovated many times in one's life. Important to see self in God, not, side, not outside of tr the Trinity and grace. Right, because I think over and over again, this false image is sometimes it's just created by ourselves, by our own egos too. Uh, but also uh, I think sometimes we allow ourselves to be influenced so many times by things that are are not have nothing to do with Christ or the church, and so have to step back and examine uh, the mind in our heart, and um, and certainly this is important, you know, on a daily basis for us to have this kind of examination. But at times we really have to take a hard look at what it is that we believe and why. You remember Francis's. Again, questions, who am I, God? Who are you? Who am I? Who are you? Perfect prayer. You know, it's it's taking us right, right where we need to be. And uh, and we don't do that en enough. You know, the, that simple question. Okay, so why don't we wrap it up for this evening? Uh, always a pleasure. We're really in the thick of it now, and uh, certainly, and but it's ever so beautiful. Uh, it's it's almost breathtaking at times. I think as you sit back and listen to it, and uh, and certainly tonight, it, there are extraordinary moments that the, uh, things open up. It's like a horizon opening up, and you see the, the beauty of what all this writing about the ascetical life was leading to. And, you know, one wants to just gasp and say, you know, it's it's beautiful. So when we close as always with our Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have a wonderful week, everybody.